Okay. Well, welcome everyone and thanks for joining us today. Uh, just for a little housekeeping, um, if you can keep your mics on, on mute and ask questions directly in the chat, that, that'll make the call go well. I'll be, my, I'm Justin Beckwith, the Competitive Program Director, and um, I'll be the admin on the, the call here. Um, we'll have time for people to engage uh, with more questions and, and perhaps some dialogue at the end. Uh, another note, just that we have uh, Brian Fish speaking on club development, international qualification updates, uh, COVID considerations, and, uh, and progress in, in the fluoro, kind of frequently asked questions about uh, fluoros moving into the fluoro-free world uh, this season. Um, and then we also have, it's a separate link, but I included it in, in the email that you got this link in, uh, that, that Kate Miller's doing a, a Bill Koch uh, leadership presentation um, at five. So uh, it's a full plate here this, this afternoon, early evening, and uh, we'll try and craft in a two to five minute break between all of the talks um, if, if, if they get pushed that close. Um, our first presenter is Adam St. Pierre, uh, who I've known since being a junior ski racer. Uh, he performs a lot of the same duties uh, that I do for NENSA for, for Rocky Mountain Division, which is essentially Colorado, uh, as well as serving uh, U.S. Ski and Snowboard's uh, cross-country sport coordinator. Um, in that role, he's been doing a lot of work with uh, national uh, working groups, uh, coaches, and officials from throughout the country on the, the range of topics that, that are, are out there right now and, and continuing. Um, he also is tasked with creating content for uh, coaches' education and uh, a, a big part of that program. So, um, Thanks for joining us, Adam, and the, the floor is yours. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Justin. Uh, it's always good to, to talk to New Englanders. Um, I grew up in, uh, in, in New Hampshire and went to college in Maine, so I got my, my feet wet skiing thanks to, to NENSA programming. Um, and I think NENSA puts on uh, some incredible events for, for athletes, coaches, um, and, and, and clubs, um, and, and are really leading the country in, in a lot of the things that we are uh, implementing now, including you know some of the the COVID considerations and the uh, the, the fluoro ban um, that will be forthcoming. Um, hopefully, we can talk. Brian can talk more about the fluoro ban. Uh, most people have been somewhat preoccupied with with COVID uh, for the past few months, but luckily, my uh, my topic today will be a little more lighthearted. Um, so I'm going to talk about the level 100 coaching certification uh, and and what the certification contains, as well as the process for uh, acquiring that certification. Um, let's, let's see how we do this here. There we go. Um, so the level 100 coaching certification is geared towards athletes in phase one and two, uh, of the athlete development model. Um, so these are athletes who are, uh, you know, generally below 10 years old, uh, and, or, you know, less than, less than two or three years in the sport. Uh, so what, separates cross-country skiing from, from more of an alpine skiing um, is that we will have athletes who are adults who may fall into phase one and two. Um, so your master's programming, your, your athletes who are just coming to skiing as a 20-something you know, or a 30-something, um, we, we try to cover in phase one and two, although a lot of it does tend to be uh, centered on those who are, who are biologically uh, you know, new to the sport and, and new to life, you know, less than 10 years old. Um, the coaching process starts with uh, just some general kind of coaching ethics. Um, and, and you could call these, you know, the, the foundations of coaching. Um, so I'm just going to summarize some of those, you know, a big one is to be an athlete centered coach. Um, and I included a, a quote here from um, Vince Anderson, who's a the head track coach at Texas A&M, um, which if you follow track and field produces uh, a lot of really fast 400 meter runners, but um, coaching isn't about you. It is about the athlete. It's always a sign of danger when you make any situation about you rather than about the coaching or about the team. It's never about you. It's about something way bigger. Um, and I think this is an important consideration because uh, you know, very few of us get into to coaching for our own glory. Um, and if you did, you, you probably should have picked uh, an, an alternative profession because often uh, the coaches are the, the behind the scenes people uh, doing the dirty work. Um, another quote, and I promise this won't all be quotes, uh, this is from a book, Running to the Edge by Matthew Futterman. Um, it's essentially a, 
uh, a biographical novel uh, about Bob Larson, who coached uh, Meb, Meb Kaflesky uh, and Dina Castor to uh, Olympic success in the marathon. Um, but I read this book and, and this quote really stuck with me. Um, and so many other professions, the goal is to make money. Coaches set out to make people, people with roots and wings, with unmatched appreciation for where they started and an unrivaled belief in the dream of where they can go. When they go there in ways both large and small, they take you with them. Sorry, just reading that gives me, gives me a little bit of goosebumps. Um, I started out my coaching career working primarily with, uh, with young athletes, with, with these phase one, two um, athletes, athletes up to you know, about 12 or 13 years of age uh, here in Boulder, Colorado. And one of my goals as a, as a young coach was to have one of these athletes that I started coaching at eight or 10 years old go on to make you know, the, the Olympics or the world championships um, and have them on the, the medal stand saying, you know, I just want to be listed among the people they thank. You know, I want to thank all these coaches, but especially Adam St. Pierre, who, who showed me a love of skiing when I was 10 years old. Um, and I think if that's an approach that we go into coaching young athletes with, um, it, it's a successful approach um, because it's, it keeps the athlete and, and their goals in mind. Uh, but we know that we are building a foundation with these young athletes that can take them uh, to incredible international success. Um, so one of the most important things for a, a new coach or, or um, a coach attempting to attain the level 100 certification is to develop your coaching philosophy. Um, my coaching philosophy is, is a Word document I keep on my desktop. Um, it's not something you know, set in stone. It's something that is constantly changing. Um, and, and since I you know, started keeping that Word document, it's probably been uh, altered you know, a few dozen times um, over the years. But uh, a number of things go into coaching coaching philosophy, and this is actually a, uh, a graphic taken from our level 100 coaching module. Um, but essentially, you know, your coaching philosophy uh, depends on, you know, where you came from as a coach. Uh, what is your background? Um, you know, the, the code of ethics provided by the US uh, it should be OPC, uh, Olympic and Paralympic committees. Um, you know, what, what are the outcomes your athletes want? Um, and how can you help them achieve them? Um, and then essential knowledge. And that's where the coaching certification program uh, aims to help. You know, we want to uh, ensure that you know, all coaches uh, who are working with athletes, you know, from, from beginner to intermediate, you know, all the way up to the, the World Cup and, and Olympic level, um, have a sufficient quantity of essential coaching knowledge um, to help their athletes improve. So, so, so usually uh, this is where I would, uh, I would pause and we would all write down our coaching philosophy. Um, and this is one of the exercises within the level 100 uh, coach certification process. Um, and I encourage you all to do it, not necessarily right now, but, but on your own time. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's a fluid document. It's always changing, but it's important because uh, most decisions you make as a coach uh, can come back to your coaching philosophy. Um, so here are, again, some things that go into your, uh, your coaching philosophy, you know, your values to the sport, how you uh, frame and emphasize competition, um, how you treat your athletes, how you deal with behavioral issues, et cetera. Um, but I think what's important about your coaching philosophy is that you, you work every day to prove it to your athletes, um, to prove it to their parents. Uh, as we know, when coaching young athletes, you know, parents uh, are as involved as the athletes, you know, sometimes more. They are transportation, they are motivation, they are um, ensuring that the kids you know, get to practice prepared. Um, Prove it to your colleagues, you know, other coaches within your club, within your community. Um, and you really have to live this coaching philosophy. Um, a challenge I lay out there for you is once you've developed your coaching philosophy, you know, live by those words and then ask other people what your co coaching philosophy is. Um, and if other people can summarize your coaching philosophy back to you, um, I think that shows that you are, are, are proving it um, and you are living by it. Um, and, and if they can't, you know, spout your coaching philosophy back to you, I encourage you to uh, look at your coaching philosophy again and see how you can incorporate it into your coaching every day. Um, some of you may have seen this poster. It, it's a little bit outdated, um, but, uh, but I still like it. <laughs> um, we've got, you know, Andy Newell. This is probably, I don't know, what, 13, 15 years ago at this point. Um, but it talks about the phases of development. Um, and I apologize that the font is so small there. Um, but I will, uh, I will lay out the rest uh, in, the, in the coming slides. 
many of you, you know, probably have, have received this poster. You know, I, I think it was mailed out to clubs to hang in their clubhouse, uh, you know, a decade ago. Um, but it's important to know about the phases of development. Um, so phase one is our, our prepubescent athletes, our, our youngest athletes, our, uh, our lollipoppers in, uh, in New England terminology. Um, and for these athletes, you know, we're, we're trying to expose them to skiing at a young age, um, where it's, it's fun, uh, they're, they're playing on skis, they're active, they're outdoors, um, and they're loving winter and the snow. Um, and it's important, you know, a lot of people, you know, especially in your, your running or cycling or triathlon sports, you know, they, they dread winter, they dread the snow. Um, and it's important for us that you know, snow, snow is essential. We, we need the snow. Now's the time of year when we are, uh, are craving it. Um, and we want, you know, people from a young age not to dread winter, but to instead be excited about the prospect of it. Um, phase two is, is slightly older athletes. Um, so they still might be brand new to the sport. They're still prepubescent, um, but we're talking about, you know, the, the six to 10 year olds. Um, and again, the, the, uh, emphasis for these athletes is, is similar. You know, we're, we're trying to get them excited to be outdoors, uh, having fun um, in the winter. Um, they're playing other sports year round. They're, they're playing soccer, basketball, you know, running, uh, whatever, <laughs> gymnastics, everything. Uh, we want athletes pr participating in a lot of sports uh, through their youth. Um, and we'll talk more about the, uh, the early, uh, early specialization and why that's a bad thing later. Um, with phase Two athletes, uh, mimicry is a great coaching strategy. Um, I, I remember back to my very first day coaching. It was December 2006 uh, at Eldora Mountain uh, up above Boulder, Colorado. And I was, I was nervous for my, my first session with my, you know, my eight, nine, 10, 11 year olds. Um, and I had this huge technique progression planned out where we were gonna go through all the, you know, all the same drills that, that many of you uh, may do or may have done in your level 100 certifications. Um, and, and we got up to Eldora and before I had said three words, the kids were skating circles around me. Um, and that sort of emphasized the point that, you know, do more, talk less. Uh, the more you talk, uh, talk to young kids, their attention spans just don't, uh, they don't work that way. So it's better to keep them moving and, and uh, get them to do what you want them to do uh, kind of through incorporating games and drills uh, that make it fun. Um, and a lot of the uh, agility type stuff and the ramps and the obstacle courses that uh, you know, Justin and Mensa have been sort of leading the country and is, is exactly what we want young kids doing uh, because it gives them the, the tools to become great skiers. Um, so again, level 100 certification focuses primarily on coaches of phase one and two athletes. Um, the, the tricky thing with, with the level 100 coaching certification is we also try to incorporate uh, masters who may be new to the sport. Um, and while they may have a longer attention span for, for wordy explanations. Um, I still believe in, in mimicry and uh, you know, more doing less talking as an appropriate strategy for those athletes. Um, you know, if you have an athlete who, who's never skied before, it doesn't do a heck of a lot of good to give them a lengthy uh, verbal technique explanation. It's better to have them ski and then provide you know, short valuable feedback as they are skiing. Um, the other phases, you know, sort of just for your, your own edification, uh, you know, the additional pre-puberty phase would be phase three. Um, so these are athletes that, you know, maybe they've been skiing for a couple years already. Um, they're starting to become your, you know, your, your U14s and your, your, your U12s. Um, but notice the, the commonalities. We're still focusing on, you know, games that work on their skills. Um, we're trying to incorporate process-based goals with this group because they um, hopefully are starting to see some of the links between practice between training and their, their competitions. Um, we're still focused largely on fun. This is a really crucial age um, where kids, particularly girls, drop out of sport altogether. Um, not just skiing, but, but all sport. Um, it's a time where um, there's a lot of hormones and emotions and you know, kids, yeah, they, they, they just have a lot to do. Um, so we have to ensure as coaches that skiing become, or skiing remains something fun, something that they want to do um, and keep them in the sport. Um, importantly, you know, training does not have to be, to be specific to be beneficial at this point. So where, you know, we may introduce roller skiing, um, it's primarily as, as a fun thing, you know, whether it's, you know, playing soccer or hockey or, ro or lacrosse on roller skis, all of which I've seen, or, you know, doing agility and ramps um, and just trying to get comfortable on roller skis so that they can become a training, uh, a training tool in the future. Um, 
you know, for, for those of you who've maybe taken up roller skiing later in life, um, it, it takes a sufficient amount of time before you're comfortable enough on roller skis to actually use them for training. Um, so if we introduce those, those roller skis early on um, and teach them, you know, how to, how to control them and how to have fun on them, um, then we can use them for training later on. Um, phase four is, you know, another, uh, another tricky one, your, your middle school ages, uh, girls and boys going through puberty. Um, so again, we want to keep it fun. This is, this is still a time when athletes often drop out of sport. Often this is when athletes are, are sort of asked to, to choose one sport over the other. Um, we want athletes to continue, you know, doing a variety of sports. Um, we, we don't want athletes specializing at, at this age. Um, it's really important at this age that you, you uh, recognize that athletes are in different you know, biological ages. Some athletes have gone through their growth spurt, um, some athletes have not, um, and, and they made it, may need a different uh, motivational approach um, to ensure that we maintain a growth mindset so that they, they still believe they can get better um, and they don't become complacent you know, if they have good results because they are you know, bigger and stronger than their age group peers. Um, again, we can start preparing athletes for their future by, by just exposing them to what their options are, you know, um, you know, what, 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 where can racing take them, you know, whether it's junior nationals or, or international competition. Um, a thing I like to highlight with phase four athletes and, and with other, you know, even into phase five, other juniors is that you want to prepare them to work with other coaches. Um, you know, it, it may be, you know, you want to establish strong bonds, um, with your athletes, but you also have to know that it's unlikely you are going to be their primary coach throughout their, their career. You know, they're going to go on to other teams and other clubs and other colleges and have other coaches. So we want to create athletes that are, are resilient and, and malleable um, and, and coachable um, and can work with other coaches to continue to improve. Um, we have to understand as coaches that uh, we, we are not the only experts out there. Um, and we have to teach our athletes how to uh, appreciate you know, knowledge and, and experience um, from, from others. Um, and, and to make the best of that. Um, once, once we get into the, the post-puberty, post hopefully that's when athletes are starting to think, I'm a ski racer. Um, and they may still participate in, in you know, your soccer or your running or your cycling or rowing. Um, but we want them to start thinking you know, of skiing as their primary sport, even if it's not their only sport. Um, and and you know, even if an athlete doesn't think of skiing as their primary sport, they wanna uh, continue to use it as a complementary activity um, we should support that too, because years down the road, they, they might change their mind and they may decide that, that skiing is better than mountain biking. Um, or, you know, later, uh, later in life, they may decide that I really like skiing through high school. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, volunteer with my local club or, or donate huge sums of money. So we want to keep athletes, you know, in, involved in sport at whatever level they, uh, they desire um, throughout their, you know, their, their career. Um, and to make sure that they have a, a positive experience with cross-country skiing. Um, this is where, you know, athletes start, we, we may start to incorporate some, some travel to competitions and, and uh, the focus on competitive results may increase. Um, that's not necessarily uh, a good thing or a bad thing. Um, it's just a thing. Um, kids at this age start to, to look more into, you know, how they stack up on the results sheet. Um, but it's important that we try to bring results back to, to, to work, uh, to effort, to, to the number of hours they put in and um, the, the quality of those hours. So always rewarding effort over results. Um, and then we're talking, you know, into phase six, our, our, our fully adult athletes. You know, what's interesting, this is the, the, the last phase, sorry, uh, the last phase of development. But, you know, if you look 16 and 17 is, is still pretty darn young. Um, and if you look at most long-term athletic development models, uh, they don't, you know, encourage, you know, specialization in one sport un until, you know, 16 or 17 or even 18 or even 20. Um, and one of the things I've always loved about cross-country skiing is that to be a great cross-country skier, you can't just ski. Um, you, you have to run, you have to bike, you have to swim, um, you have to do all these other things. So um, I think, you know, the, the early specialization, uh, you know, a lot of the the bad things about it, you know, the, the increased potential for injury and burnout, I don't think they apply to cross-country skiing because we are by necessity a diverse sport. You know, we have our, our summer season, our fall season, and our winter season, and they may include, you know, very different activities. Um, and I think that's, uh, 
that's an important thing for, for us as a sport moving forward uh, to ensure that we are, you know, we're, we're telling people, you know, we are, we are a lifelong sport that enc encourages diversity uh, of, of training modalities and activities. Um, and that, you know, that's something you know, running and, and cycling and other endurance sports can't say. Um, maybe triathlon can, you know, just by nature of, of that competition. Um, so again, uh, for the rest of today, I'll be talking mostly about the, the phase one, two athletes. So new to the sport, um, generally, you know, single digit uh, in, in age. So uh, this is a, a group of skiers near and dear to me. I have a seven-year-old son who's entering his first uh, official year as a member of the Boulder Nordic Junior Racing Team. So uh, I'm excited to be a, a team parent this year. Um, a lot of times, the first question you may get asked as a coach is about equipment. Um, because for an athlete to get into cross-country skiing, they, they have to make an, an initial investment in equipment. Um, we need skis, we need boots, we need poles. Well, poles are a little bit uh, uh, questionable for your phase one athletes. You may want to just start them with boots and, and skis and get them uh, used to moving on snow without poles. But you know, what, what kinds of equipment should you be recommending to athletes um, in each phase of development? Um, how do they have to take care of that equipment? Um, you know, everything from skis, boots, poles, um, and then to, to waxing. You know, what kind of waxing requirements are there for phase one, two athletes? And probably one of the most important things for those real young athletes is, is clothing. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever had a, a group of, you know, crying young skiers out there uh, because they're frozen on a, you know, on a 12 degree morning. Um, I can remember one practice uh, very clearly where all my assistant coaches came back to the van in, you know, their, their base layers because they had given their jackets and their gloves and their hats uh, to crying cold kids. Um, and that prompted a sort of, sort of a stern email to the team parents to remember to dress your kids appropriately um, because we can't afford to have all our coaches get frostbit. Um, there's a lot of words on this, but, but essentially, you know, how should you actually train phase one and two athletes? Um, you know, th there's a lot of exercise physiology and, and training theory out them, but, but how does it actually apply for, for young athletes? Um, you know, one thing I, I always remembered is, uh, it takes about six times as long for an athlete after puberty to learn a movement-based skill than before puberty. So if a 10 year old learns skate technique in one year, they can accomplish in theory what it takes six years for, uh, for, a, for an older high schooler or even an, an adult to accomplish. Um, I don't know if it's a, an exact rule, you know, maybe there's some range there, but uh, looking back on my own ski career where I didn't start racing, uh, I didn't start cross country skiing until I was 16. Um, and I clearly, clearly remember, I think three years ago in Anchorage, I was out uh, testing some wax uh, for glide and I finally clicked and think, I think I finally figured out skating. Um, so if you do the math quickly, that was, that was you know, over 20 years into, <laughs> into my ski career for me to pick up skating. Uh, but then you look at some of the, the young kids who start skating at you know, eight or 10 years old, and you know, they're, they're beautiful to watch um, by the time they're 13 or 14. Um, so it's important that we expose kids to, to skiing at a, a young age so that they can make the most of their, uh, their technique development. Um, so in terms of training for, for our phase one, two athletes, we're really just trying to get them uh, comfortable on skis, um, making them into good general athletes, uh, helping them build coordination um, and, and confidence so that they can ski all types of conditions, all types of terrain. Uh, terrain. Um, we can start to talk about you know, the, the, the training levels, the, the level one, level two, level three. Um, in reality, for kids this young, you know, I, I don't think it makes a whole bunch of difference. Um, young kids, they don't have the, uh, the, their body size to lung ratio is, is, is too big. Their lungs are too big for their body. Um, they're not going to get a ton of the adaptations to easy level one endurance training that, uh, that an older kid, that a high school kid or, or an adult will. Um, so it's, it's more important that they're having fun and, and learning to move on skis. Um, and less important that they're going out for, you know, three hour over distance skis. Um, a three hour over distance ski is probably not something you want to incorporate with your phase one and two athletes. Um, what we are trying to incorporate with our phase one and two athletes is developing the outdoor, uh, the culture of outdoor endurance athletics. Um, 
So we, we break it you know, simply into socialization. That's you know, teaching kids that it's fun to go ski with your friends. Um, purposeful play, that's you know, taking that, that group of friends that enjoy skiing together um, and having them perform activities and games that, will, that, that serve a purpose, that will make them better skiers. You know, specializations in here, I prefer to call it prioritization. Um, we don't want kids specializing. We, we want them prioritizing skiing and, and using other activities to, to complement it. Um, and then achievement and mastery. That's where, you know, the, if you've done the first three steps right, you know, hopefully the kids, they, they want to achieve, they want to get better. Um, and then eventually they can you know, become masters of the sport. Um, you know, whether that means competing at, a, you know, at an Olympic level or uh, going back into coaching and, and kind of starting the process over again with young skiers. Um, once you've established that culture of outdoor, outdoor endurance, you know, within your club, within your team, within your program, then you can establish the culture of training. Um, and, and that's the, the notion that, you know, getting out almost every day, you know, five or six days a week and, and doing some type of exercise, um, you know, whether it's running, biking, roller skiing in the, in the summer, whether it's going to the gym and doing some strength work, um, whether it's, um, you know, for, for a young kid, it might be going on a hike with your family. Um, but you know, you need step one before you can teach step two. Um, and then you've got to have kids that are invested in, uh, in, in training, in the daily, uh, process of, of executing, uh, you know, appropriate exercise before you can build a culture of performance. Um, so the U.S. team is really proud of the, the culture of performance that's, uh, that, that exists now, you know, within our, our world cup skiers. Uh, but we're also very cognizant that that culture of performance couldn't exist without you know the culture of training that was instilled in those athletes by their their prior coaches um, and the culture of outdoor endurance activities that was instilled in those athletes by you know their their even earlier coaches and in many ways their parents um, parents play a key role in this as well um, so some of you may have seen this poster before it essentially shows the the sensitivity windows um, and what that means is that at different phases of development, athletes are able to uh, make gains bigger or make, make quicker and better gains in certain areas than others. You know, for instance, for our phase one, two athletes, you know, we don't know a ton about phase one athletes. They're, they're really young <laughs> um, and they kind of just improve through natural growing processes. But we know that the phase two athletes, you know, they're, they're really quick at picking up motor skills. Um, you can watch a kid go from, you know, a completely novice skater to, to pretty darn good, you know, in just an hour, um, if, if you keep them moving. Um, they can start to develop their, their speed. So encouraging them to, to ski fast, you know, not always uh, long and steady, have them do short sprints, you know, whether it's in, in games or uh, relay races or, or stuff like that is really good for our phase one, two athletes. Whereas if you look up here at, you know, phase five, where you know, there's things like strength and anaerobic power, um, you know, doing doing six by one K intervals for a phase two athlete is not going to have the desired effect um, of, of developing, you know, uh, anaerobic power or, or aerobic fitness um, because the, the hormonal milieu just isn't uh, appropriate. You know, that's, that's sort of something that you need uh, the, the post puberty uh, hormones and, and body type to, uh, to make gains in. Um, so the, there's no need, you know, to have, have a young athlete do, you know, six by one K intervals probably even, you know, a three minute interval is, is longer than a phase two athlete needs to do. Um, so keep, you know, interval work, uh, keep it, keep it fun and keep it short. Um, real short loops for, for relay races or, or drag sprints, that kind of thing. Um, as the athletes get older, you can start to incorporate, you know, longer intervals or, or races. Um, and, and this is largely reflected in um, how long we ask our athletes to race. Um, I know here in Colorado for our uh, U8 and U10 athletes, they race 1K. Sometimes it ends up being, being one and a half. Um, and and I, I, I like it when we keep it closer to 1K because uh, we want to teach the athletes to ski fast. Uh, I'm going to put Justin on the spot here and ask uh, how long the, the races are for the youngsters in, in NENSA programming at uh, Bill Coke Fest. Oh, exactly. I mean, they're ranging sort of one to 3k even shorter for the youngest ones yeah you, you can have them do a half k right. um interesting anecdote uh maybe you don't see this as much in new england but we see it in, in rocky mountain is uh parents say 
well, I'm not going to travel with my kids if they're only racing 1K. And, and that's, uh, that, I don't know if it's a Colorado thing, a Boulder thing where everyone thinks longer is better. Um, but yeah, let's keep our kids <laughs> racing short. Um, let it be a, an actual all out effort instead of, uh, you know, them slogging in a 10K um, often. Every once in a while, go for it. Expand their horizons. But for the most part, keep them moving short and fast. Um, periodization. Again, um, it, it's sort of a, a term that applies more to our, our older athletes, but it, it essentially means you don't train, train the same way year round. Um, you have uh, different phases of training where you're focusing on different things. Sometimes you're focusing on you know, easier base endurance. Sometimes you're focusing on sheer speed. Sometimes you're focusing on VO2 max. Um, and while that might be important for, for your older juniors, your phase, uh, you know, four, fives, and sixes, um, for our phase ones and twos, you know, we, we sort of have that variety built in um, as long as we're not, uh, we're not doing things that are age inappropriate for them. Um, for your master's athlete, it, it becomes a bit more of a consideration. Um, you may have a master's athlete who wants to utilize cross-country skiing as a way to improve their performance in, in a summer sport, you know, triathlon or, or mountain biking. And their, you know, appropriate cross-country ski training would look different from an athlete, uh, you know, a master's athlete who, who's getting into it and wants to ski, ski the Berkey or, or ski, you know, the New England Marathon Series or, or ski in some of the, uh, the Zach Cup races. Um, so, you know, keep the end goal in mind. Um, so if it is, you know, a master's athlete looking to race on cross-country skis, their, their periodization might look different than uh, a master's athlete who's looking to utilize cross-country skiing as, as training for another sport. Um, but for, for the young athletes, you know, the, uh, we want to ensure that we have their, their long-term development in mind and, excuse me, um, keep the focus on, on fun um, and, and learning the basic skills um, and learning to do those basic skills you know, quickly and well. Um, the physical adaptation timeline. So there's you know, a couple different aspects of fitness. You know, fitness is, is not just VO2 max. It's not just uh, your, your one rep max bench press, um, flexibility, strength, speed, um, endurance, and, and work capacity all factor into what we, we think of as fitness. Um, and we need to incorporate training that, that works on all these areas. Um, although I did just read a great study about why, uh, why stretching isn't necessary. <laughs> we can talk more about that later uh, for, for most sports. Um, but what's important to know is that you know, if you work on flexibility, so I, I do a yoga class today um, and I feel, you know, more flexible. My range of motion has increased. If I skip yoga tomorrow, I'm, I'm almost back to ground zero the next day. Um, flexibility, you know, increases and decreases almost on a day-to-day -day level. You know, strength um, is more week to week. If I commit to doing, you know, 10 pull-ups a day, um, I'm going to be better at pull-ups within a matter of weeks. Uh, a lot of those initial adaptations are just due to better uh, neuromuscular control. Um, and then you actually start building muscle. Uh, but similarly, if I stop doing my daily pull-ups, you know, within a matter of weeks, I'm, I'm back to square one. Um, speed works on a, on a month to month. Um, endurance, you know, takes many months, you know, and, and years and, and work capacity, which is the ultimate goal of cross-country ski racing to be able to, you know, to work really hard for the, the you know, duration of the race. Um, that is a, a years long process. Um, and that is why, you know, the, 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 the World Cup skiers, you know, they can't just take a year off and expect to maintain their results. They, they've got to keep pushing themselves and pushing the envelope um, in order to continue performing at a high level. But it's also why you sometimes see a, a, you know, a recently retired skier who still has some pretty darn good results for a couple of years uh, after. Uh, and they, they chalk it up to, to muscle memory. Um, but a lot of it is that, you know, they built up this incredible work capacity and that takes a long time to, to fully disappear. Um, there's different types of workouts. You know, th there's your, your easy aerobic endurance workout um, and there's your, you know, your, your speed and power or strength workouts. And those workouts affect the body differently. Uh, and it's important to know, you know, how long it takes before you're ready for another workout. So, you know, your, your true easy aerobic endurance you could do a couple of those a day um, and, and you know, not be, become overly fatigued. Um, whereas you know, strength workouts, if you, you know, do a, a good strength workout, you might be sore for two days and it's not productive to do another strength workout um, for, for two or three days after, uh, after a real 
uh, a real solid strength session. So it's important when we're training, you know, more for, you know, a master's athlete who may be um, looking at cross country ski racing for a winter um, or, a, or, or a younger, uh, an older junior or, or young senior athlete. Uh, it's important not to, to schedule workouts sequentially that don't fit. You know, for instance, if you do a strength workout on Monday and then try to have them do VO2 max intervals the next day, that's not setting your athlete up for success. Um, there's, there's a high likelihood that VO2 max interval session will be compromised by the strength session the day before. Um, so it's important to, to see what the athletes are doing in, in making your daily plan. If you know that you know, you'll, you'll have your, your kids skiing on a, uh, on a Sunday and you know that they were you know, off doing a, a local race on a Saturday, you probably don't want to schedule a, a super hard workout for them the next day. You probably want to keep it uh, lighter, keep it more focused on, on technique and, and fun. Maybe play more games and do less relays um, that day. So just keep in mind how you are uh, incorporating you know, di different effort levels. Um, and remember that for, for young kids, um, there's not a ton of value in, in doing you know, long aerobic endurance or extensive endurance or anaerobic intensity. Um, you know, have them doing you know, short bursts of speed uh, in, in the form of games and, and, uh, and drills and relays. Um, trick them into moving fast. Um, one of the basic principles of exercise physiology is the supercompensation principle, which is essentially you, you apply a training load. Um, for a few days after that training load, you're actually, you're actually worse. You're, 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 you're less fit. Um, as you recover from that training load, you get stronger um, and your body supercompensates. So you, you actually become stronger than you were prior uh, to application of that training load. And then if you don't apply another training load, you, you lose that effect. Um, that's called detraining. Um, and in skiing, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to time workouts such that you, you apply another training stimulus at the peak of supercompensation um, so that we can continually see this, uh, this long-term growth, this long-term improvement. Um, and there's, you know, there's guidelines to do it, but there's no, there's no magic formula. And that's where as coaches, we have to be constantly listening to our athletes, talking to our athletes, you know, is your athlete still tired? Well, it's probably not good to hit them with a, another hard workout until they're feeling less tired. Are they tired from training stress or are they tired because, you know, they had a rough day at school or because they had to, you know, run a mile all out at gym class or because they, you know, didn't sleep last night because their, their little sister was up coughing. Um, and that's where it's important to know, you know how your athletes are feeling when they get to practice um, and trying to uh, adjust practice uh, appropriately. Um, adaptation, adaptations plateau. If you do the same thing over and over and over and over, uh, eventually you, you, you stop getting improvement from it. Um, that plateauing takes anywhere from two to six weeks. Uh, so generally, you know, if, if you work on uh, or prioritize one aspect of training, um, you should switch it up uh, every, every so often. Um, and this is to ensure that athletes don't pla plateau for too long. Um, and it's also good for young athletes because it, it keeps them interested. Um, it, it keeps practice exciting and, and allows them to, uh, to remain engaged and, and excited to come to practice each day. Um, again, you know, this is largely more for the, the older athletes who may be following a more regimented training plan. Um, with our young athletes, it's important. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the daily session um, and how we can uh, utilize that with our young athletes uh, momentarily. But I just put this slide in here um, this is an old slide. It's been around for, for years. Um, and it's essentially, you know, about how many hours of training should athletes, uh, do each year. Um, and, and the real, uh, I guess the important takeaway is that, yeah, you do a little bit more training each year. Um, but it's important to remember that, you know, if you don't train, you know, 600 hours as an 18 year old, it's unlikely you're going to be able to train 700 hours as a 20 year old. It, it's all progressive. It, it's all built on what you've done before. Um, for our, our phase one, two athletes, which are kind of off to the left side on this graph, you know, there is no recommended hours progression. Um, we just want them to be active as much as possible. You know, they're not wearing heart rate monitors. They're not uh, necessarily keeping training logs, um, but we want them to be doing a lot of things. You know, uh, I think an hour of activity a day is a good recommendation. Uh, and that doesn't mean, you know, one hour, seven days a week. It might mean, you know, a two hour hike one day and, and a couple of days off. But uh, we need to have our young kids uh, 
being active um, in a variety of activities uh, to, to provide a base for later training and later success. Um, again, uh, more focused on the older athletes, but uh, most successful cross country skiers have followed a, uh, a period at, or a polarized training approach. Um, and the polarized training approach says that the vast majority of your training is, is in like a zone one or a level one below two millimoles of lactate, easy conversational, however you want to define it. The vast majority of training it isn't that hard. Um, it, it's just going out and, and putting in the work. Um, and then there's a much smaller uh, volume of training performed in higher intensity zones. Uh, a really cool study just came out about uh, Mar Martin Fourcade, you know, a, a pretty good French biathlete. You could say he's probably the second best uh, male biathlete ever uh, behind Bjorn Dahlen. Um, and they did an 11 year uh, analysis of his training. Um, and what I found striking about the study is that uh, he, he performed, I think he was, he was about 86% of his training volume was, was level one or easy. 4% was like a moderate effort. Um, and then 4% was high intensity. And then the last 8% was strength. But when you look at his career, the dude raced like 30 times a year. So of that 4%, which made up about 30 hours of his annual training volume each year, 20 to 25 of it was racing. Um, so the amount of intensity he was doing, you know, outside of race season is, is pretty small. Um, and I think as coaches, sometimes we get a little skewed towards doing more intensity um, because it provides sort of a, a quicker adaptation timeline. You know, athletes get uh, faster, faster um, with, with intensity-based training, but it isn't necessarily the best for long-term development. So we've got to make sure with our, uh, our young athletes, particularly as they uh, progress into kind of the, the, the puberty and the older junior status, um, that we are you know, doing the, the vast majority of training in, in a truly easy intensity. Um, again, for young kids, you know, they don't have the, uh, the appropriate, you know, body systems for uh, adapting well to, to long endurance training. Um, so we don't need to send them out on, on super long uh, over distance workouts. We want to keep them uh, engaged and learning the, uh, the skill sets and, and the speed um, and those attributes, which they are uh, very well adapted to, uh, to improve upon. Um, the creative coach can make specific ski training uh, a year round thing. Um, so depending on, on where you are, you may have a, you know, a, a one to six month on snow season. Uh, six months is probably a little generous for most places, but, uh, you know, we can't do all our improvement on, on snow. We, we've got to be, uh, training in the off season to, uh, to mimic our on snow activities so that we can, uh, make the most of our training. And that's where, you know, you, you can design strength exercises like a, like a one-legged deadlift. If you look at this leg, uh, you know, knee over foot, hip over knee, you know, shoulders square and over foot, that's real similar to how you glide on a skate ski. Um, you know, similarly having, uh, having this, this young lady do uh, like a, a hurdle drill or a cone drill, you know, that translates to bounding, which translates really well to classic striding. So, uh, an important thing for those of you who may work with young athletes in a dry land setting, in addition to an on snow setting, um, is you can do ski specific uh, technique work uh, dry land. Um, and it is an important thing to do um, so that when you, know, you do have those, those days on snow, you don't have to start at, at ground zero. You know, you can, you can progress to, um, to actually having fun on skis instead of, um, instead of starting with the, the real basics. Um, so this is what I think is the, the key component for uh, young coaches, for coaches in phase one, two. But I think it's also a key component for, you know, for all coaches. Um, and essentially, it's the daily session. It's the thing you have the most control over. Um, you know, when, when the kids show up to practice on a Saturday morning, what are you going to do? Um, and in my own coaching career, I, I went from, um, you know, I'd show up with like a, a paper and pen written out. Uh, daily session and sometimes I'd get to half of it and sometimes I would completely scrap that session. Um, so in reality, I think it's important to come with, you know, plans A, B, and C. Um, you know, for instance, you get there and you, you plan to ski a certain trail and you find out, you know, that trail wasn't groomed last night. So you've got to, uh, you know, call an audible and, and move somewhere else. But um, I always like to start with a session kickoff. Um, essentially, 
getting the whole team together. Um, and this was really important for me coaching. Uh, my team included athletes, you know, from, from eight to 19 years old. Um, and our session kickoff was always the same. Um, as soon as you got to practice, you, you headed to the stadium, um, which was, you know, a big open area at our local ski area. Um, and we had, you know, a series of drills um, that the older kids would do and the younger kids would mimic. Um, and that got everyone, you know, from young to old on, on the same page to start. Um, and then, you know, once, uh, once the majority of the team had arrived, we split into our, our age uh, and or ability groups and, and move off from there. But um, the session kickoff allowed everyone to, to kind of gather together, uh, provided some team commun or team continuity. Um, and then, you know, the coaches could, could confer real quick over, you know, who's taking what group on a given day. And um, then they could, you know, break into smaller groups and, and explain the goals for the day. So for an older group, that might be a real extensive explanation of, you know, we're skiing trails X, Y, and Z, and we're going to do these intervals and these drills for young kids, you know, it might be, okay, first we're going to, you know, ski to the, you know, we, we had a hill called Beaver's Revenge, um, which was just a steep downhill. And we just do laps of that thing. The kids loved it. Um, but, you know, keep, keep the activity simple. And you know, we're going to ski over to Beaver's. We're going to do a couple laps of Beaver's to work on our downhills, uh, which also tricked them into climbing hills uh, to, to get up it. And then we're going to, you know, regroup here and we're going to play some sharks and minnows um, and giving the kids, you know, an idea of what can expect. Otherwise you've got young kids asking, when can we play games? When can we play games? Well, I told you at the beginning of practice after we ski, you know, so many loops of beavers, then we'll come back and play games. Um, so I kind of in, you know, put the session kickoff in the warm up. I kind of did them in reverse order. And, and that was just the necessity of, uh, of our location where we had uh, a bit of a ski from the parking lot and we'd have kids arriving at, at slightly different times. Um, but the warm up is a great time to include drills and it's a great time to keep your whole club together uh, if your club encompasses a, a variety of ages. Um, and I think that's important because the, the younger kids often look up to the older kids um, and, and you know, the, the older kids can provide mimicry. So if you know, the older kids are you know, practicing their double pole and the younger kids are following, that's a great way for the younger kids to, uh, to pick up how to double pole without you having to, to talk a lot. Um, the main body of the session, you know, that's, that, that's what it sounds like once you've you know, had the kickoff and, and warmed up, you know, what is the, the bulk of the session going to be? Um, is it going to be you know, a, a bunch of games? Are you gonna um, ski certain trails? Are you gonna do a relay race? Um, having an idea of what you wanna do and, and maybe it's a menu of like five or six things you could do on any given day. Um, maybe a prioritized menu where, okay, we're gonna try to get through you know, four of these six things and you know, if we only get to three, great. Um, it's still been a productive session. Um, whether you write it down or not, uh, I think is, is sort of up to you. Um, my, my first probably five or so years coaching, I like to have it written down. Um, and then uh, whether I got lazy uh, as an experienced coach or perhaps more efficient as an experienced coach, I would just keep a, keep a mental checklist. Um, cool down, I always like to bring, again, I, I try to bring the whole club back together in, in the same stadium areas. And we would actually perform uh, a lot of the same drills we did in the warm-up. Um, I think it was, uh, it was good. There's some theories that you should do um, technically intense things early before you're fatigued. Um, but it's also important that you're able to do those things uh, later when, when you are fatigued. Um, some of you may have heard of, of Gino Ariema, a uh, famous UConn women's basketball coach. You know, they, they had so many undefeated seasons and championships. Um, but he was known for, um, he would proceed every like on court practice with a hard, you know, strength workout or cardio, because he wanted his team practicing exclusively when they were fatigued. Um, because, you know, you, you make decisions differently. You, um, you know, you have to play different when you're, you know, you know, only at 80% capacity and not hundred percent capacity. Um, so I think from a ski coaching perspective, you know, we don't, we don't want to set kids up for failure um, in that they're always wrecked when we're trying to do our most technically intensive work, you know, whether it's, you know, a bounding drill or, um, you know, or a skate V2 drill or something. But I think it's really important to reinforce those uh, technical modalities late in a practice. Um, because when it comes to racing, you know, we all know a lot of athletes technique breaks down, you know, at 8k of a 10k race or, you know, at, at, for me about 46k of the Berkey, uh, I tend to blow up a little bit. Um, but bringing the whole team back together and, and redoing uh, a lot of the same technical uh, aspects, uh, I always thought was a a really productive thing to do. Um, the session wrap up might be as simple as a, uh, hey, great work today. Um, 
you know, get your dry shirts on in the van and have a snack. And we'll see you next week uh, where we will be, you know, classic skiing and, and probably working on, on, on uphill striding. Um, and, and you're sort of, you're, you're bringing a close to today's practice. Uh, you're letting your athletes know, you know, what they can do to, uh, to recover from the practice. Um, and you're giving them a foreshadowing of what's to come. Um, some people call that the, the hugs and high fives, right? Um, so I always found it important to, you know, meet every athlete before they, you know, left with their parents um, and, and give them a high five and tell them they did a, a good job. And, um, you know, if it's an athlete that, that you witnessed, you know, during the course of the practice, you can give them something personal. Like, I really, you know, I really like the way your V2 improved today. Or, um, you know, thank you for, you know, for helping, you know, little Jimmy when, when he was struggling. Um, just any type of, of positive feedback at the end of practice uh, leaves young athletes motivated to come back um, and, and puts them in the right mindset to, uh, you know, to become great people, great teammates, and, and great skiers. Um, with young athletes, we, we want to incorporate, you know, strength training, uh, core strength training, plyometrics, uh, but it's important that we don't, you know, go straight to the, the big boys, right? You know, a lot of people think of strength training and they picture, you know, muscle bound individuals you know, with, with lots of weight on a bar squatting in the gym. Um, and that may be an end goal for strength training, but that's not how we start out in strength training. Um, I had the, the great opportunity to coach the uh, U18 Scandinavia trip to uh, Rovaniemi, Finland a few years ago. Um, and we stayed at, at a sports gym called Santa Sport um, because they're north, uh, north of the Arctic Circle, apparently where Santa lives. Um, but the gym at Santa Sport, you know, every day they'd have these youth groups, you know, eight, or 10, eight, eight to 10 years old. And they came in and they were practicing Olympic lifting with, with broomsticks and dowels. Um, so they were learning the movements um, for, for Olympic lifting so that, you know, later in their career when they were, you know, physiologically developmentally ready for Olympic lifting, they, they, were, they had the movements down and, and they could progress right to, to weights. Uh, whereas if they hadn't learned those movements in that window where learning motor tasks is, is so much easier, um, it'd take them a lot more time to learn how to do an appropriate, you know, clean and jerk or an appropriate deadlift. Um, so it's important that with young kids, we're teaching them how to strength train, um, but you know, by using body weight. Um, uh, it's important that we teach them the, the basics of, of core strength, you know, it's, you know, stabilizing on the floor so that when they're older, they can do all the you know, fun uh, you know, balance work, TRX work you see some of the US ski teamers doing, or um, I actually think a lot of the, uh, the slack line balance stuff that you see you know, Jesse Diggins posting on, on her Instagram, I think that's a great thing to start young kids on. Um, and, and you know, maybe they can progress to the point where they're throwing things and, and putting on and taking off L.L. Bean sweatshirts uh, on the slack line. Um, but with young kids, you know, we want to introduce the basics, um, running, jumping, bounding, uh, core stabilization, um, you know, push-ups, pull-ups, ba basic things. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, complicated or, or in a gym. Um, but we want to set them up with a foundation so that as they become older, they can utilize um, the, the, the training strategies they'll need to. Competition can be a really tricky one for young athletes. Um, some athletes you know, are, are reluctant to, to race. Um, so competition means different things to different athletes. You know, it could be relay races at practice. Uh, it could be going to the Bill Koch League Festival. You know, for, a, for an older athlete, it could be uh, you know, trying, to, trying to do their, their best at the Craft Spray Marathon. Um, so it's important that we, we have an idea of what the competition pathway looks like um, for athletes at, at different stages of development. Um, and then we want to encourage athletes to, to do the things appropriate for them. You know, for, for level one, uh, phase one and two athletes, we're, we're encouraging largely local competitions. So whether that's, you know, within the club doing, you know, fun races, relays, time trials, um, whether that's traveling to your, you know, your local, uh, you know, Bill Coke or Lollipop race, um, or, or maybe it is, you know, a season culminating in the, the, the Bill Coke Festival at the end of the year. Um, as like a sort of something to, to build up to and, and uh, end the season on a high note. Um, you know, within the, the notion of kind of preparing an athlete for competition later, you know, where the, the stakes of competition and the results might become a little more, um, you know, a little more of the focus, it's important that we instill young athletes with a healthy perspective on, on competition um, and, and help them 
you know, learn how to prepare for a race. Um, you know, some athletes, even at, at eight or 10 years old, they get incredible pre-race anxiety um, because they are putting so much pressure on themselves. And it's important that we as coaches help them uh, to deal with that. You know, and, and some of that becomes you know, having a, a pre-race checklist. You know, what, what, what gear do you put in your bag? You know, what socks are you gonna wear? Um, what do you do when you, you get to the race? What does your warm up look like? Um, and, and you can start practicing those things even with really young athletes. Um, it might not be the, the same warm up you would have a, you know, a 20 year old athlete do before the NCAA championships, uh, but it's a, it, it helps athletes to know what to expect. Um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, my, my son's been doing online second grade um, and he's going back in person on Tuesday, you know, fingers crossed, um, but he's nervous. Um, for, for this big change. So we've been practicing, you know, a checklist of, well, you know, what, what can you do to, to keep yourself and, and keep everyone safe, you know, during this, this pandemic time. Um, and it, it, it's real similar to, you know, a, a competition day checklist of, you know, what can you control and what can you ensure uh, you do prior to competition. Um, and that will help, you know, reduce the stress and anxiety around the things you can't control. Okay, I promise I wouldn't have you know all quotes, but these were some some other quotes that I thought it was important to uh, to keep in here. Um, some of you know Pete Vordenberg; he's a, a former U.S. ski team coach, um, and I started doing my coach education when when Vordy was the he was the head guy. Um, but one thing I think I remember this from a uh, a clinic I did at, at Dartmouth with him up in Hanover. Um, the root word of competition is competere, and and I was a uh, a Latin student in, in high school and college, so this struck a chord with me, uh, which is Latin for uh, to strive together. Um, and that is the greatest value of competition, to push yourself and others to become better. Um, even the, in the hardest and most, most painful effort, competition isn't about working against, but working with. Um, and, and I think of it this way, oops, sorry. Um, like you may have, a, have an athlete who is, is super focused on, on beating another athlete. Like all I wanna do is, is, is beat Susie today. Um, and, and Susie, you know, maybe Susie has a bad day or maybe Susie's sick and doesn't show up. Um, the, the notion of, of you know, beating one person um, isn't a real great motivator. Um, and, and one thing I've, I've loved through working with Rocky Mountain, um, particularly with our, our junior national team is that you, know, you have these kids that are they're, they're competing against each other for a spot on the junior national team all season. And then, you know, as soon as you come together as a junior national team and you're, you're wearing the same jacket and you're you know, staying at the same hotel, um, all of a sudden they're teammates um, and seeing uh, friendships you know, that sprout from these kids that you know, they've been fighting tooth and nail against each other all season um, is really important. And it's important for them to know that they are made better by racing against uh, those competitors. Um, so, you know, framing it as you know, you're, you're not enemies, but you're, you're striving toward a common goal um, and you can help each other get there. Um, you know, I, I've worked pretty extensively with Brian Fish over the years, but um, I love the way he uh, frames competition as, as a significant challenge in framing competition is getting away from the simplistic viewpoint that winning equates to success and losing equates to failure. Um, and if, you ever, if you've ever done a pre-race or post-race debrief with an athlete, um, a lot of times you get a very different debrief before they see re the results versus after. Um, and sometimes you have an athlete who thinks, I had a great race. I did this right and this right and this right. And then they see the results and they're unhappy with their, their placing. And all of a sudden, oh, I had a terrible race. Um, and it's important to try to get athletes uh, to focus on you know, successes you know, within the race, irrespective of results. Um, like, you know, I skied that downhill really well. Um, I warmed up great. Um, I ski tested great. Uh, I, I did what I could, but you know there were there were 19 people who did it better than me today, um, and trying to uh, separate success uh, and failure from from the results. And those are things that we as coaches can uh, can start framing for athletes from a young age. Um, you know, we, we don't want to just praise the kid who wins. Uh, we don't want to just praise the kid uh, who comes in last. We want to praise every kid for their effort um, and find something um, individual that that they did well. Um, you know, whether that's, a, you know, the, the kid who's, who's often last, but, um, you know, he really, you know, nailed, nailed his technique on a certain part of the course. Or, you know, my first year skiing, my entire goal was to complete a race without falling. 
Um, and I managed to do that in the, the last race of the season. So, you know, find, find goals that your athletes can, um, can identify with and, and then praise them for their effort towards those goals. Um, don't just praise, uh, praise the athletes who are, are finding success um, at an early age. Um, the USOPC did uh, a study uh, where they, they surveyed hundreds of Olympians um, and asked them kind of why they got into sport. Um, and then there's also been, you know, kind of surveys of, of actual kids, you know, current kids uh, about why they do sports. And, and this is the, the prioritized list. Um, number one, far and away is having fun. Um, do something they're good at, improve skills, you know, get, become fit, hang with friends, make new friends. And way down here at number seven is, is to compete. Um, and there may be, you know, an individual athlete or two who comes in and, and they're just there to compete. They just want to win. That's not necessarily a healthy approach to, to, to sport. Um, because when that athlete, you know, they find a, find a time when they, they don't win, um, sometimes that can be sort of a, a self-destructive moment. Um, so it's important that we keep the, the focus in our young athletes on, on, on why they're there. Um, and often they are there to, to have fun, you know, get exercise, be with friends, and, and, and improve. Um, and those are things as coaches of young athletes that, that we can help, uh, help with. Um, uh, many of you may have, have struggled with this, uh, of having young athletes who they say they aren't ready to race or they aren't ready to compete. Um, and I think often what this means is uh, that they're scared not to win. Um, and they don't want to start competing until they think they can win. Um, and unfortunately, that, that's not a, a healthy approach to competition. Um, so how can we you know, take those athletes and, and um, try to progress them from a you know, a, a scared to compete or a won't compete until I win mindset into a, uh, a healthy uh, competitive mindset. Um, and I think a lot of ways, you know, sometimes you can trick them at, at the start with, with collaborative games, you know, whether it's relay races or, you know, other fun activities uh, you can imagine that, that there's a little bit of a com competitive side, you know, in, in that you're pushing yourself and you're, you're trying your hardest, excuse me, um, but you're also, you know, it's not, uh, it's not high stakes. It's not nerve inducing. Um, one thing I always like to do with athletes was have a sort of a mock race um, where we would just pick a, you know, pick a Saturday morning and we would treat it, you know, just like a race where they would, you know, they would show up and we'd put a bib on them and we'd tell them their start time. And um, what I really like to do is make it a, a classic race. And I would have the, the older athletes act as the, the wax staff um, and make them do wax testing and wax skis for the little kids, um, which I thought accomplished a dual purpose. But, um, you know, and try to expose that athletes to uh, competitive games and, and competitions in a, a low stress environment that they can get used to um, and, and become comfortable with. Um, because we're always trying to build comfort and, and confidence. Um, one thing you may see, like, if you let kids pick their own relay teams, you know, often the, the fastest kids want to be together. And then you end up with these uh, very you know, non-competitive relays. Um, so, you know, you can, you can try to match up relays that will be competitive. Um, another trick I've, I like to do is, is have them pick their own teams and then design the relay. Um, so you might have, you know, the, the two 13-year-olds want to be together and the two eight-year-olds eight get stuck together. So, so maybe they're skiing, you know, as many laps as they are uh, years old. Um, and maybe that gives the, you know, the eight-year-olds a chance to beat the 13-year-olds. Um, so you, you can try to level the playing field so that kids have uh, a fun experience competing and, and are pushed to, uh, to, to, to drive themselves to, uh, to maximize their effort. Um, if you put a kid in a, you know, a, a situation where they you know, can't see a successful outcome, they're unlikely to be motivated. Um, so again, this is sort of a dated document, but, um, in terms of how many competitions a year should, should athletes be participating in. You know, with our phase one and two athletes, you know, we're, we're not encouraging a ton of, of uh, you know, sanctioned competitions. Uh, we, we want them to be having fun, um, having fun races. So if, if they want to uh, participate in some races or, or um, express that desire, you know, they're, they're welcome to, but it's not something that we necessarily need to push as, as coaches. Um, as they get older, we want them getting more and more experience with, with, with you know, sanctioned races or, or uh, you know, real races where there's you know, bibs and timing chips and uh, results published. 
Um, but it's important that we, we start doing races and start dialing in um, the, the race day routine so that athletes you know, can have reduced anxiety and uh, can be able to perform you know, when they need to. Um, if we look at the average competition format in, in like the World Cup and uh, Olympic Winter Games, you know, we're looking kind of the magic numbers is, is three. So we've got about a third sprint, a third mass start, and a third interval start. Um, and, you know, maybe that's something we should try to mimic, you know, within our, our regional race calendars is to make sure that athletes are doing uh, some sprints, some mass starts, and some interval starts so that they uh, get experience in each discipline. Um, important note, um, and, and we've kind of botched this a few times in Rocky Mountain, um, a sprint for, you know, a 10-year-old athlete is, is very different from a sprint for a, uh, an 18-year-old athlete. Um, so, you know, sprints for a young athlete, you might want to do on a, a very short course. You know, maybe it's a 500 meter course, maybe it's a 200 meter course, um, because that enables them to, to actually go at, at sprint speed. Whereas if you have those young athletes do, you know, a typical one to, to 1.5K sprint course, it's not really a sprint for them. Um, that's, you know, that, that's their, their distance race. Um, so make sure that if you have, are having young athletes participate in, in sprints, that you are keeping them short and uh, giving them an opportunity to, uh, to succeed. Um, a lot of young athletes, I think, thrive more in mass starts because it's a little simpler to understand. Um, and if they participate in, in other sports like, like swimming or uh, cross-country running or, or mountain biking, those are typically mass start events. You know, everyone stands on the start line, they, they shoot a gun, everybody goes, first one to the finish line wins. Uh, whereas interval start, interval start competitions uh, are, are perhaps a little more nuanced. Um, and sometimes young athletes uh, they, they lose focus out there and, and kind of forget their racing. So it's important to practice, you know, all types of competitions uh, when possible. Um, this is another graphic from the, the L100 module, but it's just kind of repeating a lot of the, the things I've said where uh, as coaches, you're trying to find a, you know, kind of a balance between, uh, you know, skills and training versus versus racing and competition and uh, with young athletes a lot of times they're they're one and the same you know they're they're learning skills and, and training uh, through you know small informal competitions um, as, as a ski, ski community as a governing body as, as NENSA as Rocky Mountain Nordic um, you know it, it's on us to provide uh, events and programming you know uh, appropriate for athletes of all ages um, if we want to maximize our success at, at, at junior nationals or um, you know, maximize the number of national teamers that, that come out of our regions. We need to be providing, you know, age appropriate uh, events across the spectrum. Um, we can't expect to have, you know, to, to win the Alaska Cup like New England always does if, if we don't have any youth programming. If we expect kids to start skiing at 16 and, and immediately be winning. Um, so we need to, uh, within our clubs and within our regions, you know, provide what athletes need at each stage of development. Um, these are some, some silver bullets that, that the U.S. ski team has identified over the years as um, you know, things that, that should be always incorporated. Um, and that's things like common goals. Um, so like when I talked about my, my daily sessions and bringing the team together uh, at the beginning and the end of practice, you know, even across the age spectrum, um, I think that created some, some common goals where the, uh, the older athletes wanted the younger athletes to succeed and the younger athletes wanted the older athletes to succeed. And then we'd show up at a race and, you know, the 10-year-olds the are out there cheering their hearts out, you know, for their 16-year-old idols. Um, and, and I think it's important to, to build those common goals. Um, step by step and don't, don't skip steps. You know, you can't, uh, you can't skip straight to winning until you've built the foundation for it. Um, Try to make each training session, you know, the, the, the best you can. Um, and if you have, uh, have a season of, of best in the world training sessions, then you're going to improve. Um, I always like the athlete empowerment. Um, as coaches, you know, we can, we can motivate athletes, but if, if an athlete doesn't, you know, want, want to be, uh, you know, a junior national champion or an Olympian, that's not on us to decide. Um, if an athlete wants to, you know, just, just ski for fun, or they want to uh, ski as a way to, to stay in shape for their primary sport. Um, we want to empower athletes to, to have those goals and then, you know, work with them to achieve them. We can't force anything onto young athletes. Um, technique is the biggest area we can, we can help young athletes improve. Um, and 
uh, with your phase one, two athletes, really the, the biggest thing you can uh, ingrain in them is, is appropriate posture, um, an athletic body position. Um, and everything sort of stems from that. Um, I'm going to skip some of this because it's, uh, it's better, better done in person. Um, but essentially, we want to you know, be ingraining the fundamental athletic body position, which uh, many of you have probably heard. It's you know, the, the weights in the ball of your feet. Your knees are slightly bent. Uh, you know, you've got your, your ankles are, are flexed. Um, slight forward lean from the ankles, you know, relaxed shoulders, pendulum arm swing. Um, hopefully these are, are terms that, that uh, you've heard before, but if you don't have you know, that fundamental athletic body position, uh, you can't start doing the fundamental movements of cross country skiing. Um, if you try to jump straight to, to, to skating without ingraining that fundamental body position, you get a lot of kids you know, ski, skiing in the back seat you know, with their butt sticking out behind them um, and they're wondering why they, they can't make it up any hills. Um, so if you notice that, it's important to go back to the fundamental body position. Um, so anytime you, know, you, you find an athlete uh, is stuck, you know, it's good to you know, come back to, to basics um, and then let them progress from there. Um, you've always got to start with a simple thing you know, before you add complex. Uh, you can't just jump right into, you know, uh, like a, you know, a, a, a clobo stride uh, until you've started with the, the, the basics. They've got to be able to stand up on their skis, um, you know, as, as with everything. So again, with our, our phase one, two athletes, you know, we're largely you know, focused on step one, uh, assembling the fundamental movement patterns. And that's your uh, basic body position. Um, and then kind of the, the basics of movement. Um, once they've man managed to, uh, to, to become experts in that, then you start to you know, talk about how the, how the core moves. Uh, what, do you, what do you do with your trunk? Um, and then you can focus on the limbs. Uh, a lot of us as coaches jump right to the limbs, like do this with your arms um, because they're easy to see. Uh, when in reality, you know, if, if they're doing something funny with their arms, it's often because they're doing something funny with their trunk uh, or, or maybe they're in you know, the wrong athletic body position. So. Uh, before you try to do micro corrections of, of things like arms and legs, uh, make sure you're getting the, uh, the big ones done first. So here is the, the verbal description of the fundamental body position. Um, and with the level 100 certification, essentially there is an, uh, an online module and then there's a, an in-person component. And that in-person component uh, has a small sort of group discussion uh, based on the content of the L100 module, uh, but the bulk of it is is going through, you know, technique progressions, um, and essentially uh, the, the 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 leader of the hands-on portion kind of demonstrates the technique progressions, um, then has each you know potential coach go through them, um, and then then we coach each other um, and essentially grade each other to to make sure that uh, coaches uh, are able to to demonstrate appropriate technique. Um, I think the the most overused term in ski coaching is, is get your hips up. Um, and, and when in doubt, coaches just tell athletes to get their hips up. But uh, it's important to, to become well-versed in the fundamental body position so you can actually see, uh, you know, what that does for an athlete. And often, um, you know, athletes can tell when you're just making something up. Um, Important to think about fundamental body position between skate and classic is, is more or less the same. Um, you know, with, with skating, you just have your feet slightly rotated outward. Um, and that fundamental athletic body position uh, is similar for other sports. You know, it's, it's similar to defensive position in, in basketball. Um, it's similar to, um, you know, your, your defensive position in, in baseball, um, your, your, your ready position in, in track and field. Um, it's just a, a good athletic body position. Um, so often you can, uh, you can utilize examples of sports that athletes may be familiar with um, in, in cross-country skiing. Um, and running is often, often one of the better examples. And you can do a lot of technique work, you know, running and bounding uh, that will actually carry over really well onto skis. Um, with classic, you know, once you've established that fundamental athletic body position, um, then you can start talking about you know, the fundamental movements of classic technique, you know, the, the pendulum arm swing, uh, how the core contracts. I'm having a hard time not contracting my core. 
while I talk about this, <laughs> uh, you know, how you actually kick, what, what is the actual movement of, of the foot and leg and how do you actually make uh, forward progress. And these are all things that, you know, for a master's athlete, they, they may uh, tolerate and, um, and, and appreciate a, a wordy explanation. Um, with, with young athletes, you know, they're, they're probably, you know, they're, they're gonna be gone quick if you start talking about impulse kick and, uh, and extension. Um, but if you can, you know, create some drills or create some games that force them to do it, um, you know, one of my favorites is always no pole classic skiing. Um, it's really hard to cheat, no pole classic skiing. Um, and so if uh, your athletes are struggling, um, you can always take away their poles and make them, make them figure it out. Um, it's important that we have, you know, a consistent terminology nationwide. Um, and, and that's tricky because, you know, everyone calls the different, uh, the different gears something different. Um, I like uh, this, this graphic. Um, this is from a, uh, a study by, by Loznagard and all. Um, and they looked at the different uh, energy components of cross-country skiing. Um, and they divided it into kind of what, what techniques um, and how did it vary with, with speed and incline. Um, and it's important that we define technique use based on uh, you know, a, a combination of speed and incline. And in reality, the technique you use in specific terrain is dependent on you know, skier ability, uh, you know, preparation of skis, uh, snow conditions, and, and effort, right? Um, you know, on, on an easy ski, you might double pull up a, a hill that uh, you stride up. Um, excuse me, you might stride up a hill that you double pull, you know, at a harder effort. So um, I like to talk about, you know, gears, like in a car, your, your gear one, that is, that's your slowest gear. Um, so that's typically your, your steepest terrain or your, your mushiest terrain if you're skiing in mashed potatoes. Um, and classic, that's your herringbone. Um, and that's a really important technique to practice uh, for our young skiers because, um, you know, they're not always going to be able to kick up the hill, um, even, if they have, uh, even if they have fish scales. Um, so practicing herringbone, you know, getting, getting your gear one dialed in uh, allows them to ski in you know, the, the steep terrain. Uh, gear two is your diagonal stride. Um, and again, sometimes that works great in steep terrain if you have, you know, the, the right wax of the day and uh, the snow conditions uh, allow you to. Um, if you're stronger, you know, you may find, uh, find yourself double pulling up things that a, a, a less strong athlete uh, ends up striding up. <coughs> uh, one thing the, uh, the U.S. ski team coaches uh, want to emphasize for young athletes, you know, they may watch, you know, a, a Simi Hamilton or, um, you know, an Andy Newell or, or some of those strong World Cup guys, and they might double pull a whole course. Um, and that's probably not something we want to encourage our, our real young athletes to do. They, they just aren't strong enough. Um, and, and that's an age where we need to teach them, you know, the basics of skiing. Um, so it's important that they not try to, try to be, uh, be heroes and double pull everything. Um, I also like to practice the, the downhill gear, you know, gear five. And, and for classic skiing, that's, that's tucking. Um, and it's important that we get kids comfortable moving fast on skis. Um, and conveniently, it, it's also kind of fun. Um, so, you know, you might have some athletes that are just fearless and bomb downhills and you may have some athletes that um, are, are a little more uh, a little more timid um, but it, it's good to get them used to moving on snow at speed on, on classic equipment <coughs> and similarly for skate you know the, the thing I like people to notice here is that it, it's all the same you know skate and classic technique is, is largely the same um, with the only difference being a, a slight uh, widened stance and an externally rotated feet in skate versus classic. We've got the same concept of gears and skating uh, where you've got your, you know, your, your coaches, oops, sorry. How do I get back here? There we go. <clears throat> We've got your, your coaches skate or your diagonal skate um, as gear one. You've got your V1 um, in, in gear two. Uh, V2 is gear three. Uh, again, you know, a lot of your World Cup skiers will, will V2 pretty much everything. Um, and it's important that we, we teach young athletes to utilize the variety of their gears. Um, an important difference between skate and classic is there's, there's six gears in skate, but only five in classic. <clears throat> and, and I think it's important that we practice the, the gear five, the skating without poles. Um, and that, that's a gear that um, you know, some athletes, if you have them 
uh, no pole skate. They, they kind of just you know, waddle around. Um, but we really want athletes to learn to generate power without poles. Um, so I like to do, uh, do a lot of you know, work in gear five, the, the skating without poles. And usually that would be used in, in pretty high speed terrain. So often a, a gradual downhill, you know, not so fast that you're flat out tucking, but um, you're moving pretty fast. Um, but I think for, for practice, it's good to, to expand the, the use of that. Um, I think one of the best no pole skaters I've ever seen is a young man by the name of Gus Schumacher. Um, and I was out at nationals in Houghton last year in the sprint, which he, he went on to win. Um, but you know, hundred meters into the race, it was a gradual downhill start. You know, he was no pole skating uh, away from the field. Um, you know, the, the best gears in the country are, are, you know, V2 and V2 alternate behind him. And he's just no pole skating away. Um, so obviously he had very fast skis, but he just looked like a, like a speed skater, um, just hammering out of the start. Um, and I think it's, it's an important skill uh, to work with, with our athletes, especially the young ones where uh, sometimes poles just seem to get in the way. Um, the steps to certification. I feel like I skipped a slide somewhere. I wanted to talk about the actual equipment recommendations for young skiers. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and do that now um, and, and apologize for, for waiting till now. You know, with, with young skiers, it's important that we not overload them with equipment, right? Especially if they're just getting into the sport. Um, you know, if you have a, you know, a six, seven, eight year old skier who comes to you, they wanna join your team and you tell them, okay, you're gonna need uh, race skate skis, race classic skis, practice skate skis, practice classic skis, classic and skate boots, classic and skate poles. Like they're probably not gonna get into the sport. That's just too big a financial um, and equipment burden. Um, so for your phase one athletes, we, we recommend a single pair of fish scale classic skis um, and a pair of, you know, comfortable boots, you know, probably, probably a combi boot. Um, we we want to introduce kids to, to classic first because it, it's easier to, to get into. Um, it's easier to get the motions down. It's easier to learn uh, to move on skis. Um, we like fish scales for, for these real young skiers because there's no maintenance. They, they show up, they ski, they have fun, they go home. Um, so it's important that we, we keep the equipment requirements really, really low of our, our, our youngest athletes. Um, instead, focus your equipment um, attention on, on you know, what they're wearing and making sure that they are wearing appropriate clothes, moisture wicking base, base layers, insulative mid layers, uh, you know, wind, windproof outer layers, um, hats and gloves, that kind of thing. Um, but keep the, you know, keep the skis and boots really simple. Um, there is some debate whether poles are useful for your, your phase one athletes. Um, as a, a parent of a phase one athlete, I, I think uh, my son has been skiing for three years and I gave him poles at the second half of last year. Um, because before that, you, you just see that as soon as you give them poles, they, they forget what to do with their legs. Um, so I, I would say most phase one athletes, their poles are, are probably super, superfluous. Um, as they get into phase two, that's when you can start um, introducing, you know, you might get them on a waxable classic ski instead of a fish scale. Um, we don't recommend having separate skate gear. Um, I, I'd like to keep, you know, most phase two athletes just doing classic. If they really want to do both classic and skate, um, I, I can't in good faith recommend combi skis. Um, and, and I speak from personal experience here, you know, a, a combi ski is, is, is not a good classic ski and not a good skate ski. Um, and it's not very fun uh, if you're constantly struggling on, on equipment that's not good. I think it's, it's better to invest in separate skate and classic uh, than, than a combi. Um, and luckily, you know, New England, there's lots of programs around whereby athletes can, can borrow or lease skis for the season. Um, you know, there's a lot of teams will have, a, have a, a ski swap where older athletes can, can pass on skis to younger athletes or maybe it's within a family. Jeez, I don't know if you guys can hear my three-year-old squeaking in the background. Um, yeah, just a little. Um, but for your phase two athletes, you know, we still don't want to overburden families and kids with, with equipment. So we want, you know, one pair of boots, a pair of combi boots is great. Um, one pair of poles, you know, sort of a, a like a, a shoulderish height uh, is appropriate for, for skate and classic at this age. Um, if they, if they want to do both. Uh, a pair of waxable classic skis is wonderful. Um, and, and a pair of skate skis if they want to start, uh, start learning to skate. Um, in phase two, you may want to start uh, having athletes have their, their own small wax box. 
you know, for kick, it includes a cork, you know, maybe a, a blue, red, and a blue, violet, and red uh, stick wax, and maybe a, a universal clister. Um, and for the majority of conditions you see, you know, those waxes will, you know, allow you to go out and, uh, and ski around. Um, I think a lot of uh, parents and a lot of athletes, particularly your master's athletes, who will almost exclusively come to skiing as, as you know, skate skiers only, um, a lot of them are intimidated by the, the art of waxing. Um, you know, they, they see you know, coaches show up to a, a race with you know, 300 different waxes to test. Um, and it's important that we keep it simple for our young athletes. Um, it, it's sort of up for debate whether you have you know, phase two athletes wax their own skis or you wax their skis for them or parents wax their skis for them. I think it's important that we start to um, instill, you know, responsibility and equipment care in young athletes. Uh, but from a time perspective, you know, if you've only got an, an hour 15 to, to ski with your, your crew and it takes them 20 minutes to, you know, apply three layers of, of violet kick wax, um, it may be quicker um, to, to, to do it yourself. Uh, but of course, that just kicks the can down the road um, for them to learn to do it later on. So uh, I'll leave that at you know, your, your discretion as coaches. Um, and then once you get into you know, phase three and four and, and above, that's when um, you start to uh, expand the, the equipment to having you know, separate skate and classic poles and separate skate and classic boots and race skis and training skis. And then uh, at the upper tier, you may have you know, multiple pairs of race skis for, for very specific conditions. But for our phase one, two athletes, we want to keep it uh, as simple as possible um, so that as long as they show up with a right and a left boot, they are, uh, they're in the game. Um, steps to level 100 certification. So uh, to start with, you've got to be a, a US Ski and Snowboard uh, member holding a coaching license. Um, the coaching license requires a number of things. Uh, one is a, a background check, uh, as well as to undergo safe sport training. Um, you have to be first aid and CPR uh, certified. Um, you have to undergo a, a simple concussion training. There's a simple avalanche training, uh, which yes, is required for, for cross country athletes. Um, and if you watch the, uh, you know, the Alaskans crust skiing in, in April and May, uh, they could be an avalanche terrain, I guess. Um, but it's good, good knowledge for all of us. Um, and then as part of that, that coaching licensure, there is a coaching fundamentals course. Um, and that includes a lot of the sort of the, the basics of coaching information, uh, sort of coaching ethics, uh, some of the coaching philosophies in there as well. Um, so that's required of, of all people holding a coaching license, regardless of whether you are pursuing the level 100 certification. Um, so once you've you know, accomplished those steps, then you can register for the level 100 certification. Um, at that time, you're asked to register for the, the hands-on technique progression. Um, we were hoping to be able to offer one uh, this weekend, but uh, COVID sort of, sort of stopped that. Um, but hopefully in the coming weeks, uh, maybe as early as, as you know, early October, which I think is, is next week, if you look at the calendar, um, we'll be able to offer those hands-on uh, technique progressions. And essentially the, uh, the level 100 candidate, um, you know, registers for, for a local one. So, you know, maybe you register for uh, one on, you know, December 6th in Craftsbury, Vermont with, um, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's uh, Ms. Miller, who we'll be talking a bit later, um, who will be one of the coach developers in New England. Um, you then complete uh, the, the coaching fundamentals course, uh, which is sport agnostic. So it's the same for, you know, alpine coaches, cross country coaches, you know, freestyle snowboard coaches. Um, and it's really, you know, just about the, the basics of coaching and, and responsibilities. Um, then there are cross country specific modules. Um, those are stuff that, that uh, I've helped to develop and, and Brian Fish and uh, a number of coaches have, uh, have contributed to. As you complete those, uh, those modules, uh, which contain a lot of the information I've talked about today um, in, in a slightly deeper, uh, deeper level, uh, you have homework. Uh, so you complete what's called the portfolio. And the portfolio is essentially uh, a number of questions about each topic that, that make you think. Um, and not, not to give too much away, but one of the questions is, um, should you encourage combi skis for young athletes? Um, and, and they're questions that are designed such that for you to answer them, you kind of have to understand. Um, so they're not just, you know, simple yes, no, true, false. They're, they're more designed to get you thinking. Um, you have to actually, you know, complete and, and print out uh, that portfolio when you show up for your hands-on practicum. Um, the start of the hands-on practicum is, is a discussion of the portfolio. Uh, so the, the coach developer, whether it's you know, Justin or Caitlin or 
Uh, I think we have probably, we're probably going to have around, around 10 uh, coach developers in New England you know, in geographically diverse locations so that, you know, if you live in Maine and you want, can't go to New Hampshire, you, you can still find a level 100 clinic, uh, hopefully this fall. Um, your coach developer will, will essentially grade your portfolio. Um, it's a pass fail. You know, they're not going to go through and, and grade your grammar and make sure your commas are in the right places, but uh, they want to see effort um, and, and an effort to, to complete, uh, complete it thoughtfully. Um, so this, the hands-on starts with a discussion of that. Uh, then you move on to uh, the hands-on technique component where the coach developer kind of demonstrates some technique progressions, um, has, has you demonstrate some technique progressions, and then has you coach uh, your fellow coaches on those technique progressions. Um, the coach developer is, is looking for uh, a number of things, uh, including, you know, can you demonstrate good technique? Uh, you know, how's your eye? Can, can you assess movement patterns? Um, and how is your coaching? You know, can you communicate um, to, to others, you know, how to, how to improve or how to do something? Um, so again, it's, it's, it's not a, it's a, a one to five scale. Um, and we want our level 100 coaches, you know, at a three out of five or better. So, you know, you don't have to, to ski as beautifully as like a Sophie Caldwell uh, or a Jay Kern, um, but we want you to be able to, you know, to, to ski uh, and allow your athletes to mimic you. Once you've completed your hands-on uh, component and, and portfolio, uh, you'll be eligible to, to take the final exam. Uh, and once you pass that, you become a level 100 certified coach. Um, I, I realize it's, it's different than it has been in the past. Um, some of you listening may already be level 100 certified coaches, and we've had uh, a lot of questions about, you know, what, what happens to me? I've, I'm already level 100 certified. Um, and you are essentially your grandfather. You don't have to redo the hands-on part, um, but the new level 100 module uh, will be offered as a continuing education uh, opportunity for you. Um, and and you know, starting, uh, I believe this year, every two years, you need to acquire uh, eight continuing education credits. Um, each credit is, is equivalent to approximately one hour of, of engaged learning. Um, so I think our, our level 100 module um, ends up, uh, I think, accounting for four continuing education credits. Um, or you can, you know, coach at a camp, you know, with, uh, uh, with a coach developer, with the U.S. ski team, and that can get you coach education. Attending an event like this put on by, by NENSA or another body um, can count towards your continuing education. Um, Beyond level 100, um, I'm currently in the process of working with our uh, sport education department on the level 200 certification, uh, which was previously offered, um, but we're, uh, we're, we're redoing it to be more in line with the rest of uh, the U.S. ski and snowboard disciplines. Uh, so level 200 will be for the phase one to four athletes. Uh, so if you remember back to the beginning of my presentation today, uh, that's athletes you know, up to and, and into puberty. Um, so we're still talking primarily about young athletes, uh, athletes with, you know, uh, a half dozen or, or so years in the sport. So still including, you know, so, some master's athletes who, uh, who utilize the sport, but primarily focused on, uh, on the young ones. Uh, for level 200, you, you've got to do everything you had to do for level 100. Um, and then the online module will be available in spring 2021. Uh, it was supposed to be available fall 2020, uh, but again, COVID. Um, the, uh, there will be no hands-on component for level 200. It's all uh, a, a module. Uh, it used to be all classroom-based. Now, uh, now it's all online module-based. Um, and then once that's launched, we'll, we'll move into level 300 and 400. Uh, level 300 is, is essentially for the, the, the older junior and the, the senior athlete. Um, and then level 400, uh, we're trying to, to uh, align more with the so, sort of the program director, you know, the, the very experienced coach who's coached uh, for a lot of years and, and how can they, you know, improve their overall program, uh, not just their athletes. Um, oops. There, uh, there are some cool things we're, we're working on in, in sport education. One of them is a, a coaching forum, you know, where uh, all certified coaches can, uh, can, can post questions, can, can find answers, can uh, share videos uh, with each other. Um, and that's, that's sort of a work in progress. It's, uh, it's, it's working really smoothly on the Alpine side, but uh, we just haven't offered it to our cross country coaches. So, Hopefully, as more of us uh, get access to it, uh, that can become a, uh, a lively part of our coaching community. Um, and then we're trying to expand our continuing education offerings. Um, so whether that's uh, the ability to take a, you know, one of the new modules, if you are a, a coach who's, uh, who's held a level 100 or a level 200 before, um, we're also off 
we are also hoping to offer, you know, shorter, shorter modules, you know, maybe it's a, you know, an, an hour course on, on strength training for endurance performance or um, an hour course on uh, sports nutrition, you know, things that, that you may uh, elect to take uh, that would count towards your continuing education requirements and provide you some, uh, some beneficial knowledge for your coaching. So uh, there's a lot of projects you know, we're developing in, in sport education and uh, I'm super excited to be a part of them. Um, I just wished, uh, I wish they moved a little faster. So that is all I have to talk about for today. Um, and I'd like to open the floor to, uh, to questions. Um, if, uh, if any, if any are out there. I'm going to, I'm going to stop my share so I can see all your smiling faces. I, I think in this, uh, thank you, first of all, for that very in-depth presentation. That was, that was really good. Um, I, I think folks could probably just try and ask the questions. Yeah, I think if people are comfortable uh, added here, so. un unmuting, uh, feel free to just dive in. Or, or put it in the chat and I can pose it either way. Adam, I have a question. Yeah, shoot. Um, I started the uh, L100 last year in the fall and then uh, got too busy actually skiing myself to complete it. Um, I, I, I coach at EMVK in, outside of Austin. Yeah, that's a big um, program. With James, yeah, um, it's fantastic. Um, so I already did the, the L100 technique um, with, with Jim and Mark uh, last fall. Does that count? Because I haven't completed the uh, L100, uh, or should I invest in another um, uh, progression clinic? That is an interesting question, um, and and we've you know talked with the the sport education department about grandfathering in people who completed L100 previously, uh, so that they won't have to to redo everything. I don't know what they would say about you know someone who is. Uh, sort of sort of pending or, or in process um, and I would I would have to direct that question probably to, to Anna Hosmer um, and uh, yeah her, her email is just anna.hosmer h-o-s-m-e-r um, okay. I, I can put it in the chat here yeah I would I would ask her um, I'm afraid that they're going to tell you that you need to, to to start over I think Adam this is Brian um, I would, uh, this would be something I think we should have a conversation um, because um, the, you should be able to keep, um, you've already done a portion of the in-person practicum and I bet there's a way that there's still a portion of the new part that you would need to, need to do because the new in-person is more comprehensive, but um, that's a good question and, and I think we can come with a, uh, a better solution than just all or none um, that I think we could come up with because the actual course itself, the, the material that we teach in person is still the same. It's that you're also getting evaluated as well. So we'd have to go through that process. And there's also the um, portfolio um, piece that Adam had talked about. Um, right. Um, so yeah, if, if you um, email me, uh, I can, I can, uh, we can discuss with sport education and see what we can, we can figure out. Thanks. Great. We need as many, many L100s for that EMBK program. A lot of crickets out there. I must have done that good a job. <laughs> <laughs> 